My name is David Malone. I have the privilege of working at the UN University in Tokyo, where we're headquartered. And we have for a public conversation later this evening in Tokyo as our guest, Edward Mortimer, a very distinguished uh, British journalist and uh, commentator for many years in the Times of London and particularly the Financial Times where he was the main foreign policy commentator. And he made a, a, a rather radical career shift uh, uh, in the late 2000s to join Kofi Annan as his chief speechwriter, director of communications, and dare I say it, close advisor. Um, and he has remained uh, interested in the United Nations even after leaving its employ and uh, is associated with a group of uh, very distinguished statespeople known as the elders who occasionally express their views on uh, the state of the world, the state of the United Nations, and what directions they think it might take. So, Edward, may I start out by asking you, the UN's in its 70th anniversary year. Uh, when you think of it, what do you think has gone right in 70 years and what has gone wrong? Well, I suppose you could start by saying that the fact that it's still there and you know, it hasn't dissolved in another major global cataclysm, which is what happened to its predecessor, the League of Nations. <coughs> and, um, you know, one is very conscious of all the things that have gone wrong. and particularly the imperfections of the Security Council, which I, I think we will have something to say about. But uh, uh, the fact that it is still able to function, and um, for instance, that in 1991, uh, the Soviet Union, which is named in the Charter as one of the five permanent members of the Security Council, ceased to exist. And yet, without missing a beat, at the beginning of 1992, Boris Yeltsin, president of the Russian Federation, appeared in the Security Council and was accepted by all the other members as legitimately filling that seat. So I think an organization that can show that degree of flexibility does have something to be said for it. Um, as to what's gone wrong, I mean, there are plenty of things. And of course, it, um, many people would go on about its failures of management. Um, which I think are actually not greater than those of any other organization of about the same size. But um, I think the one that really is heartrending is to see its inability uh, to deal with some of the big conflicts going on in the world now. And these are not big by the scale of the Second World War, but they are uh, very, very painful and destructive. And of course, we think particularly now of the one in Syria, where the permanent members of the council are apparently so divided that they are unable to agree on any effective course of action. Now, we're sitting in Japan, mm. of mm. course, and you mentioned the Security mm. Council. Mm. And the Security Council, in some respects, is remarkably effective mm. in dealing with the number of conflicts in Africa. Mm. It's been decisive uh, and, at times, very effective. Uh, on the other hand, as you point out, it's been completely ineffective in coming to grips with Syria. And although it, uh, uh, the General Assembly of the UN took a position on the Ukraine conflict, uh, the Security Council deadlocked on the Ukraine conflict. Uh, so what is your sense of the Security Council? Has it been able to keep pace with evolving realities in international relations, the rise of some countries, the decline of others, and is its decision-making up to scratch? Well, those, of course, are two separate questions, although they often are conflated. Uh, I think in the first, the composition of the Council remains essentially, with a small adjustment made in the 1960s, what it was in 1945. And it was intended to be based on the geopolitical realities of 1945. Even then, one might ask whether uh, the five permanent members were really the five great powers of that time. I mean, two of them certainly were, the United States and the Soviet Union. A third, Great Britain, you know, was at least one of the victor powers of the war and had a large empire still at that time. 
France had actually been defeated in the war and really put back on its feet by its allies, and uh, China was in a state of turmoil and civil war at the time. So even then, there was some room for questioning how far it reflected the geopolitical realities. After 70 years, we clearly are looking at a very different international scene. The United States, still the world's leading military power, uh, and undoubtedly needs to be at the top table of any meaningful international body. Um, Russia, most people would say a declining power, certainly not the superpower that the Soviet Union was in its heyday, but still a significant actor on the world stage. China, more, uh, definitely more united, uh, economically far more important than it was, and, and, and increasingly, I think, willing to play a geopolitical role. So no great problem there. I have to say, uh, I'm not sure that anybody who was designing the organization from scratch in 2015 would include Britain and France among the five top powers. They might say that the European Union, if only it could get its act together, would be a worthy member of such a club. And they might say, and most of them would say, I think, that some of the emerging countries, such as India and Brazil, um, would merit inclusion in that category, if that's the way you want to go. When it comes to the effectiveness of the decision-making, it's not obvious that having more members, particularly if some of the members were to be endowed with veto, would make decision-making, it certainly wouldn't make it easier. Would it make it better? Uh, I, I think it's hard to be sure about that. but. Um, what I do think is a problem is that there is an increasing sense, especially in the developing world, that this is an unrepresentative body, that these five countries are too powerful, and that they should take more notice of what the rest of the world thinks. And so even when it takes good decisions, there is a danger, I think, that its authority is not respected um, because of that feeling that it is not properly representative. So I think the member states are making a mistake if they feel, oh, well, it's just too difficult to change this uh, because it is very difficult to amend the Charter, um, we may as well just carry on, which is essentially what has happened. Where for 20 years, they've been talking about reform, but nobody has felt strongly enough to make the necessary compromises. I don't think that will wash for very much longer. Great. Now, uh, a contemporary of ours in UN circles used to say of the Security Council, that it was above all expedient. Mm -hmm. Whatever was convenient on any given day would be uh, decided or announced. Uh, and there has been a sense of that uh, over time, a sense of lack of strategy often mm -hmm. in uh, the Council, and rather uh, a tendency to react to events, often quickly, sometimes very well, mm -hmm. but not to be able to agree on a medium and long-term strategy uh, amongst the members. I think that is very difficult to do because they obviously are very different in their, not only in their interests, but often in their perception of you know, how the world works or how it should work. Um, I think that they've tried to substitute for that a bit by agreeing on a number of principles and themes. Uh, one that's very often quoted is Resolution 1325 on the importance of women in conflict situations, uh, the need not only to protect them but also to empower them and enable them to take part in peacekeeping processes. The trouble is that these kind of things sound very good when they're announced, but it's very often hard to see where they have affected the dis concrete decisions on specific crises and conflicts which the Council makes. And I don't know whether there is an institutional solution to that or whether it is a purely political one and it's just really up to public opinion, particularly, of course, in the countries that these governments are supposed to represent, to jump up and down and say, hey, you agreed on this, why aren't you doing it? Now, you often sit with the elders. Why don't you tell us a bit about the group? And also, recently, they made a widely publicized uh, statement uh, that touched on the Security Council, and if you'd tell us a bit about that. No, I, that would be a pleasure. I mean, I should say that I don't often sit with them. They don't even often 
all that often sit together, actually. Mm. Um, twice a year, they mm. try to. And I think there are a, a dozen of them. Uh, and they are all very people who've had very distinguished uh, international careers. And they come from uh, all five continents, I think. Um, uh, but it was Nelson Mandela's idea, actually, uh, that there is a sort of uh, capital, uh, moral capital, if you like, that's been built up by such people. Um, and that they should, if they could speak with one voice on certain world issues, then um, they, they would get the world's attention. Um, but I think you once said, David, that it's not always clear that they amount to more than the sum of their individual parts. Mm. Um, because they, of course, they are elders, that's to say mm. they're, I think, mostly in their 70s. And um, one of them, Jimmy Carter, is actually now in his 90s. Um, and uh, they don't always think alike. Uh, and um, it, it, I think it's an interesting exercise, and I think it can have value. And as for this particular uh, assignment to do with the United Nations, which they recruited me to help them work out, um, that really arose in 2014, partly with the approach of the 70th anniversary, but also I think with the, they were, they'd been watching the, 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 particularly the situation in Syria, but other conflicts that were seemingly getting out of hand in Ukraine, for example, uh, and the situation between China and Japan or between China and some of its other neighbors. And um, they felt that the Security Council wasn't really quite delivering on the promise uh, made by the founders of the United Nations in the preamble to the Charter that they were determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Mm. I mean, if you tell that to a Syrian in present circumstances, you will get a very hollow laugh. And so they asked me if I could help them suggest some improvements uh, to the way that the United Nations handles peace and security, and particularly the, um, uh, the Security Council. And um, I sought advice from many uh, distinguished authorities, including yourself. Mm. And um, I came up with a, a sort of menu of things that they might wish to uh, consider. And in the end, they settled on four of them, um, one of which does indeed concern the composition of the council. Uh, it's a, really a proposal for a compromise between those who aspire to permanent membership and those who, for good or bad reasons, are determined to deny them that and say, well, couldn't they have a sort of semi-permanent status in which it would be longer than the current uh, elected membership, which is only for two years, and it would be immediately renewable. So that um, uh, a country that was playing an important role in peace and security in the world could do so as long as it retained the confidence and respect of the other members of the United Nations. I think that's a I, I don't want to say it's a long-term proposal because, as I said, I think it's the, the, the problem is quite an urgent one and should not be left to fester indefinitely. But you might call it a medium-term response proposal. If you're not going to get agreement on that uh, within, within the next year or so, I'm afraid. Um, the other three, I think, are more immediately actionable. Uh, one is to um, use, for the, for the five permanent members, to show greater restraint, uh, but also greater positive effort in finding ways of working together in a crisis. I think there's been a lot of focus on the veto, and the veto certainly can be a problem. But I think it's illusory to imagine that powers which have a veto are going to completely give it up. Uh, because if it requires them to accept something which they think is fundamentally wrong, and mistaken, like supposing that there was a, let's say, for example, that there was a proposed military intervention in Syria, and that one or more of the permanent members thought, well, this is actually going to make matters worse rather than better, they're not going for some moral reason to forego the opportunity to oppose it. So the elder suggestion is that there is an obligation not only on those countries that might be minded to cast a veto, but also on those who are putting forward proposals which might be vetoed to 
not regard the veto as the last word on the subject, but keep trying. And I think this is especially relevant in Syria today. I, I'm sort of hoping that recent talks in Vienna may be pointing in that direction. But of course, with the Russian planes being shot down uh, by um, Turkish missiles and so forth, uh, nobody could say that it's a particularly hopeful atmosphere, only in the sense that maybe the more alarming things get, the more people will take the problem seriously and really try to do something about it. The, the um, third suggestion is um, perhaps a more modest one, but I think very easily actionable, which is that the council should take more notice of the views of people, not only governments, but civil society, uh, particularly in regions which are affected by conflict and therefore are likely to be affected by whatever decisions the council takes. There is something called the ARIA formula, which dates back to the early 90s, whereby not meeting formally as the council, the uh, members of the council can hold a meeting and hear the views of civil society organizations. But there is a tendency to, be, to treat this as a bit of a, a formulaic exercise. And um, quite often, it's only attended by third secretaries from missions at the UN who no doubt write reports on it, but these reports are probably quickly shelved and may not even be read by their superiors. So the elder suggestion is that um, at least the heads of delegations should make a point in attending such meetings in person and that they should be held more regularly and play a bigger part in the council's deliberations. And finally, I think, I think the most immediately topical uh, proposal that the elders have put forward is that the method by which the secretary general is chosen should be made more transparent and a bit more democratic. Not, I think, turning it into a regular election campaign, which might be rather unfortunate, and would certainly have denied the UN some of its best secretary general, such as Dag Hammarskjöld, who I think in a, uh, a million years would not have put himself forward as a candidate, but ensuring that uh, those making the choice um, do so in the knowledge of what the world in general thinks, and perhaps are obliged to state a bit more clearly what their criteria are um, and uh, how they go about finding the best person in the world from whatever region, male or female, uh, to do this incredibly important job. Leaving aside the elders, finally, mm. yes. um, what were the characteristics of the Secretary General, the next one, uh, be that you, would, you, Edward Mortimer, would particularly value? Well, I think that um, you certainly need to be able to work with governments and earn or have earned the respect of governments. And I would say that includes the permanent members of the Security Council, but it certainly should not be limited to them. Uh, but I think, and this is really one of the things I think we, we, we learnt uh, in the um, period of Kofi Annan's Secretary Generalship, um, that in the age of globalization, um, the international order is no longer purely an order of sovereign states. Yes, states are very important and we cannot do without them. And you only have to look at the parts of the world where states have failed to see how true that is. But there are an awful lot of other actors in international affairs these days. There are very large international corporations. There are non-governmental organizations, particularly in the humanitarian field, which play a very important role. There are the media um, and uh, the, not only the conventional media, but the social media. I mean, it's amazing to see now how, how many people seem to announce their policy decisions in the form of tweets. And these are read uh, you know, and absorbed around the world by millions of people within, within uh, a minute or two. Mm. Um, so I think that the Secretary General you know, has to be able to play her or his part in that great national debate. Uh, because I think that the Secretary General, by the mere fact of being chosen to represent not one region or one member state, but the whole of humanity, commands a degree of attention. And um, that is a, an important opportunity, and thereby it creates an important obligation. So I think the Secretary General needs to be able to remind the world why we have the United Nations, what are the principal interests that humanity has in common, even if there are many 
divisions and resentments. I mean, climate change is one of the most obvious, and I think that the present Secretary General has certainly made a great effort to keep that in the forefront of the minds of member states, and it, and it hasn't been easy. But I think there are a number of issues like that uh, to do with not only peace and security, but health, development, organized crime, uh, uh, terrorism, and so on. Well, that is peace and security, but it's a particular aspect of mm. peace and security, um, where people constantly need to be reminded um, that there are common interests and that there is a need for common action and a common strategy. And I find that member states are generally not good at arriving at these common strategies by themselves. They are too suspicious of each other. And the same is true of other actors. I mean, an interesting example in Kofi Annan's time was the big pharmaceutical companies. Um, of course, one of the major problems of that period, and still a big problem today, although I think we are perhaps winning the battle against it now, is HIV AIDS. And it was clear by, by the time Kofi Annan became Secretary General that if you had the misfortune to contract HIV in a wealthy, developed country, you had access to antiretroviral drugs. The quality of your life was liable to be affected, but it was not a death sentence. And you could go on living, in many respects, a fulfilling life. That was absolutely not true in most of the developing world. And basically because of the cost of these drugs, which people there could not afford. And the big pharmaceutical companies were unwilling to lower the price that they were charging for these drugs because <clears throat> I think basically each of them was afraid that if it did so, one of the others would take advantage of it and use it as a back door into the main market. The there's nothing in the UN Charter which suggests that the Secretary General would have any role at all in such a, in such a problem. But actually, because he was Secretary General, Kofi Annan was able to bring the heads of those companies together in a room and get them to agree on lowering the price. And I think that one single act has probably uh, resulted in quite a large number of people, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, being alive today who otherwise would not be. So I think the Secretary General needs to be able to take that kind of initiative. And as you said, not just react to events. And the odds of a, oh, the odds woman, of a woman as Secretary General? I think the odds are probably quite good because, because I think there is a very strong feeling around the world that after eight men, it's about time that the other gender had a go. Mm. Um, and that it would be a bit of a cop-out to say that there is no woman in the world in 2016 who is able to take on this job. Uh, but I, 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 I should also say that I think nobody should get this job just because they're a woman mm. uh, any more than they should get it just because they come from a particular part of the world. Uh, I think the important thing is to find a leader who is actually capable of performing in this very, very difficult role. Several of those who have held it have said that it's the most impossible job in the world, and I think that's not far from the truth. Indeed. Well, yeah. I think this time, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. there are about 10 mm -hmm. or 11 names mm -hmm. I've heard of mm -hmm. very competent women mm -hmm. who are mentioned. So yes. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I think that it's very hard to argue this time on competence alone that so. yes. uh, the main yes. candidate should be men. Indeed, very mm. few men are coming forward uh, mm. this time. So, Edward, thank you very much. Uh, to those who uh, join us online, thank you for doing so. I think you can see we'll have a lively debate in Tokyo this evening, and we're very grateful to our guest, Edward Mortimer. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.